it's amazing what people can do with the sport. That's all he does though, he doesn't do anything else, he just, he, he climbs, that's all he does. I, 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 and they had, yeah. I, I had Chris Sharma giving a talk a few weeks ago, who was Californian kid, Chris Sharma. I've seen that video. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. Okay, um, just a couple things just before we start. Why did you uh, go to Europe to begin with? How did you find yourself in Les Andes? Switzerland. Well, Robbins and uh, John Harlan were there. We were, were climbing in the Dolomites. It was my second trip, I believe. So I had uh, ulterior motives. As much climbing uh, done as I possibly could. All right. Um, you're. How did that come about? I mean, how did you get involved with it? Well, Harlan had been up there on some reconnaissance trips, as I remember, and he just offered me an invite, and I accepted. And that was in what? What was that in February, January of that year? It was in the winter time. <laughs> when we were on the wall, you mean? No, when you were invited. I don't remember exactly. I know I got there late in the year, it was in the fall, and uh, I'm in Harlan at the Club Vagabond, and, and he talked a little bit about some of his uh, reconnaissance trips and stuff and asked me if I was interested. Took me up uh, the limestone there in the Tour d'Ai as a checkout climb, wanted to see if I knew what I was doing, I guess. Did you? Know what I was doing? No, no. <laughs> All right. I passed the test for some reason. Let's put it that way. So you then lived in Lausanne up until the time of the of the climb. Right. Yeah. And just training and climbing and. Yeah, climbing on the on the cliffs up there, the uh, limestone area up there, as you know, and there's a lot to be done. Very little had been done when I started climbing there, so it was kind of wide open. Where did you live? In the Club Vagabond. Mm -hmm. What was it like? It was mostly young people there. I mean, it was a fantastic place. There were little mini parties going on all the time and stuff. And, and I was very comfortable there. There were a bunch of ski groups uh, would come through you know, for a fortnight. And uh, plus the people that worked there. And, uh, and of course, English climbers were there. Continental climbers came through, although I couldn't communicate with them, but anyway, uh, I had people to climb with. It was great. Okay. For their names, it's been too long ago. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, you'd asked me when I came back from uh, Europe, well, I could have uh, filled you in a lot better than I can now. There was a fellow there that uh, I was a good friend with. In fact, he went off to the islands in Greece the following summer, and uh, he was another vagabond. He was a great guy, and I uh, can't remember his name. There's too much time's gone by. Mm -hmm. And that's just uh, age, I guess. Is he a ladies' man? <clears throat> I'm not certain. Uh, yeah, there were a lot of ladies there. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Did you take advantage of the situation, of there being lots of young women? No, no not really. Well, I had a girlfriend from France, from Paris, Marie France Riviere. She's uh, in California now, actually. She came through uh, years ago, and I was living in uh, Glenwood, I think. And uh, she had a job as a translator. She spoke French, uh, English, and German. And out of the blue, she called me from, from the Denver airport. And so we went to the Tetons and climbed the north face of the Grand together. I told her it's appropriate that before you go to work, you have to do a nice climb. <laughs> now we traveled down to Spain together. We made a trip down there. And uh, 
Remember, I got a spear gun, shot this huge snapper. And so we uh, built a fire there. Got an olive oil and olives. And cooked that fish in there. Actually, you know, back then, the, the uh, Spanish Riviera was a lot cheaper than uh, French. And so we made this trip, and uh, it didn't cost all that much money. We went climbing on around Montserrat, I believe it was. A lot of areas over there to climb. Mm -hmm. Limestone, too. Learn her language, and it's all prefixes and suffixes and infixes. It's a nightmare. You know, they take a four-letter word and they stack stuff in front of it and behind it. Plus, it's in reverse anyway. The language is hard. All right. Drop ice off the steps. Like I was thinking about that last night. I was trying to wonder, did I use my ice axe? You know, in this country here, uh, they use them in construction sites, and they're, they're kind of shaped like this here. you got a blade like right. this, and they curve down, and you got the handle. Oh. The scraping, the scrapers is what they are. And I was trying to think, because I knew, you know, we we're going to be talking about the club, part of which was my job there, and uh, I couldn't remember what I was using an ice axe, what I was using, I mean, so much time has gone by. Had you done much ice climbing before you went over there? Not yeah. a lot, no. Not really. No, not a lot at all. What, what, what type of tools were you using on the agate? Do you remember that? No, what were we using? I know they didn't have the pterodactyls. Hamish McInnes came up with right. that incredible design which yeah. revolutionized ice yeah. climbing. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we just had regular uh, north wall axes and, and I think we might have had one with an adze on it. It had the scoop. So, like, when Dougal would be climbing the steep ice out, he was climbing the front points, no, he wasn't cutting steps or nothing, right? No, he was front pointing. Right. We uh, went straight up the uh, right-hand side, you know, from the death bivouac, we went up uh, the third ice field. And he was chopping steps, big steps. Right. And all the ice was coming down on top of me, that's how right. I remember. Right. <clears throat> anyway, uh, yeah, some of the stuff, you know, was hard snow. It was right. easy, the lower sections. And you hit patches of ice. The hardest part of the climb for me was the ice. You know, rock climbing, after you've been rock climbing for eight or ten years, why, well, you know pretty much what to do all the time, how to handle these situations. And you get mixed pitches, uh, it's a lot more technical. Had you done much uh, rock climbing in cold conditions before? Yeah, in the winter times down in El Dorado and it different places. Right. Did a couple winter climbs in Yosemite and right. different places. There's nothing like Europe, you know, there's walls over there. They have ice walls over there that are 3,000 feet high. Right. You know, Chenard and I climbed the north face of the court. And I think we left at midnight from the hut there in the Argentier Basin and got on top around uh, 1.30. So a lot of it was done with headlamps. Right. And uh, we got on top and everything was sloughing off. I remember uh, we found our way down only with difficulty. You could hear this stuff it would slough off and then get that cauldron down to the bottom of the wall and you could hear the sounds down there with it cracking in the bottom of the wall. And we got to the hut down there, I don't remember the name of it, but they told us that two weeks earlier, two German climbers had been killed in an avalanche mm -hmm. in the same descent route. Mm -hmm. did, you, did, you know, did you know Gary Hemmings? Yeah, he did. I climbed with did Gary. Did you climb with him? Talk Eats Rock, yeah. I'm sorry? Talk Eats Rock. Right. I think they wrote a book about him. Yeah, yeah, right. In fact, the people that wrote the book, and it was an Italian couple that came by right. when I was living in Glenwood right. Springs. Yeah, right. and we, we talked uh, about Gary then. Right. <laughs> well, the interesting thing about Gary having for me is that um, I spent quite a lot of time in Paris, and uh, you should go for a walk along the Seine. Uh, 
where they have all these little stalls that they sell stuff. And one of the things they sell is Paddy Match magazines, old ones. So I always wanted to find the Paddy Match edition when Gary Hemmings rescued those guys, you know. Cause oh, and the Drew. Eh? Rescued the fellows in the Drew, is that what you mean? Right, the Drew, yeah. right. Because it was he was he he became overnight an absolute hero. And finally about three years ago I went through and I find it it was just it was incredible to find it, you know. And uh, How did that book do? Was it was it well received the book they wrote about Gary? Nick, I think, by the right. French or something. Yeah, they call them Le, Le Bic Nick des Alpes, that's what they call them. Yeah. Yeah. Like Randall and I were climbing on the line. You can really feel it. Took me about 10 minutes to get in there and get comfortable. And I went over in the uh, jacuzzi and it was way too hot. All right, so that's good. So, what, uh, according to your book, you went over to Europe in the fall of 65 just to go climbing. Mm -hmm. And the reason you went to Lausanne was because you knew all these guys were there. Yeah, and yeah. You had climbing partners. Now you have to have some sort of a, a base. Yeah. A place to live, a place to travel from, that sort of thing. And uh, that was as good as any. Robbins was there and John Harlan and... Okay, and then and you obviously then you guys moved over to Pine Scheidegg in February 66. Uh-huh. Then you went back in the spring when all that was over and you started climbing in the Alps and the Dolomites and I'm assuming you came home in the fall of 66 back to Boulder. Could be. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what I figured out here from your just from your book. So why don't we start start with that with um, why you that you first of all did you, had you just worked and saved up a lot of money to get there? Was that? Yeah, I uh, I don't remember how much pocket money I had. I know when I, when I came. The rubbing on the mic. Oh, you know? well, the sound is coming out right huh? No, it's all right. It's not bad, but I want to get it a little better. It's just this cuff keeps hitting it. So you're always fighting nylon with these systems. Start that all over. <laughs> uh, yeah, the American, the American, uh, the, it, it's a long story, it wasn't my fault. Um, okay, right. well, I'll go back to the beginning. Just go back to the beginning. Yeah, well, I, what I'd like to ask you about is the... As I was, and give him lots of time yeah. to finish. Right. Uh, well, you know, um, the British, starting off with Chamonix, in fairly large numbers, as working class guys, they would go over there, you know, and the start this. So, well, actually, I'll tell you what. Haston and Norman Smith did, and I did it as well. We'd go down to the south of England, we'd work in the pea cannon factory, you know, or the strawberry cannon, whatever. There was all this fruit, and so you could go there for a month, say after you finish university in June, and in a month you could make quite a lot of money and then go to Europe. A lot of us did that. And where we always used to end up was Chamonix and hang out in Snell's Field and. Uh, Club International, out. right? The Club International. International club at little bar where everybody Bob went. Nash, I'm going to tell you about Bob Nash. Yeah. The guy that went to Bob Nash was a great guy. He's a great friend to. Let's Bob stay on track. Well, it's just an aside. Okay. Anyway, um, so what I wanted to know was um, if you know if there was an American invasion of Europe <coughs> from a climbing point of view at that time. Well, people went there periodically. You know, I. Uh, I talked to a number of people that had climbed in uh, in the Dolomites and a couple that had been to England and stuff before I'd been there. But uh, you know, I knew more about the cliffs and stuff because the things I wanted to climb, I'd seen pictures of them more so than uh, who went where when. You know, because when I started climbing, uh, you know, it was uh, really early in the sport back in the 50s. You know, in the late 50s, and at that time. Uh, you know, my knowledge of uh, Europe and stuff wasn't there simply because, you know, I just got started and it took a certain amount of time before I figured out where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. 
But as far as the people that have been over there, you know, that was a different part of the climbing community that I was used to, because I was started out as rock climbing. And you know, you got your mountaineers and people go to Everest and things of that nature. And so uh, my uh, sphere of uh, contacts with these people was very limited. You know, years ago, I wrote a letter to Hamish McInnes, and I was uh, looking for a climbing partner. And what he said in the letter was, he says, well, most of these north wall climbers tend to stay within their own circle. In other words, he said, you know, I, I can't help you because, uh, you know, we don't know who, who you are, or your uh, capabilities and things of that nature. So, uh, so I found out, you know, if you want to go in that circle, you got to go over there, you got to climb, you got to prove yourself, and then perhaps uh, you can find continental climbers to climb with or whatever. What, what, what's the name? Dirt bags. Dirt bags? Oh. You know, like Charlie Fowler. Yeah, yeah. There wasn't those kind of people in those days, was there? Not that I knew of. Did you think of yourself as a dirt bag? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had uh, my first trip to Europe was, uh, was not good. My climbing partner bailed on me at the last minute. And I went over there anyway, and I got there too early. You know, a lot of these things I simply didn't know. Even in the Dolomites, there had been a lot of heavy snows and stuff. And I remember uh, thinking to myself, boy, this whole trip's going to be wasted. And any, uh, what happened was I, I was in uh, Cortina. I was looking for a climbing companion. I didn't speak any English at all, except there was a guide there. He had this little climbing shop. So I went in and talked to him, and I tried as hard as I could to get him to go on a climb with me without charging me, but he wouldn't do it. And so anyway, uh, I didn't get anything done at all. When I came back, I went to uh, the Schwangunks in New York, did a bunch of climbs there, and that was it. I just went over there and spent money traveling around and stuff, and no, no climbing at all. So the next time I went back was when I went to uh, Lausanne, and then I was able to get some stuff done. Uh, just a couple of weeks, maybe maybe two, two and a half weeks. But uh, at that time, uh, there were no climbers in, in Cortina traveling around or anything. I went to, uh, you're going to like this, I went to, uh, <laughs> to uh, Innsbruck. And uh, I just got in the city there. I remember eating a meal. I got some bread and uh, milk. I sat down on the curb and ate that. Then later on in the day, I had to find a place to sack out. So there was this uh, building there, big brick building. So I curled up next to a tree there by this building. And it turned out to be a woman's co-ed, a dorm. And the girls panicked in the middle of the night. They called the police. And the police come and haul me off to jail. So I spent a night in jail in Innsbruck. <laughs> of all places. You're kind of like... Uh... Well, the police, they said to me, Americans, you people have so much money. Why would you want to sleep in the ground in a sleeping bag? They seemed to think that all Americans were wealthy. And I said, no, 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 wait a second. A lot of Americans are like me. They ain't got nothing. Okay, one minute. John, over here. Did you have a guidebook for the area? Or? No. You didn't? No, I didn't have any, I didn't have any maps so have on that first trip. No, I had nothing at all. I was just traveling. I just hoped, uh, you know, I had my plane ticket and everything, and then I find out my climbing partner's not coming with me. And so I uh, had to make a decision, and uh, I thought about it for so long, I thought, you know, if I don't go, I'll be miserable, so I just went ahead and spent the money. Did you learn something? Yeah, I learned a lot. I don't go to Europe without a climbing partner. <laughs> but you know, with Lausanne, the situation there is altogether different, because there's all these climbers that are there. So you got people to pick from to go climbing. And that's been one of my problems through the years, is being able to, to uh, find climbing companions so I can keep busy climbing. I think at that time you went, what year was the first time you went? The first time I went? What year? 64, I, I think. 64? Yeah. yeah. If you, I don't know if you did go to Chamonix. Did you go to Chamonix? No, no, I didn't go to Chamonix in that first trip. If you to Chamonix in 64, you would have had a different experience. I think you would have had more trouble finding people. Yeah, I probably went to the wrong place. Yeah, I think you did. All right. Um, so
So let's get back to your time in that town. And you, you went, you knew there were people there that you could, you went there for partners. And then you got hooked into the Iger thing. Right. And then what happened, what did you do after the Iger when you got back to Les Zen? I think I went to the Dolomites uh, that next summer. Yeah. You know, Chenard came, uh, he was over there and came to the Club Vagabond and uh, he and I went into the uh, French Alps, uh, north face of the court in the Argentier base and did that climb. And I think that's the only thing we did. And then he took off uh, for the States shortly after that and I followed him. So maybe I was in the Dolomites in the spring. I have difficulties remembering, you know, where and when. Well, it looks to me from what I figured out this morning is, is that after you, you did go to the Dolomites in that spring, you climbed with, with Chenard, but I wanted to ask you about two routes specifically above Les Andes. And one is the uh, east face of the Tour de I with Don Willems. Do you remember that route? East face of the Tour de I. With Willems. I did two climbs with Willens. One was that big overhanging cave thing. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. So can you talk about that? Like, you, you guys, what do you remember from the climb? Well, I know there are other people that had been there. We found pitons on it on the lower part. And we got up to the cave, and uh, I think we were rappelling because was up there or something, and uh, they hadn't gone any further. And that was kind of my thing, so. I aid climbed up and around the thing to the lip of the thing, and then we left a rope, I believe, if I remember right, and we went back down to Lausanne, and we weren't going to bivouac. It was like 400 foot climb altogether. And it was hard climbing, uh, hard free climbing down low. Willens led this pitch, clipped into nothing whatsoever. And it was, uh, I think it was 9 plus, possibly 10A or something like that. And he just didn't like clipping into pitons. And then we got up higher in the upper part of the wall. And he took off up this rock, which was badly fractured, and hung a sling around a horn that stuck out. It was a flake that stuck right out of the rock. And uh, went up to the bottom of this real steep section, which later on I finished by means of direct aid. But he took one look at it and figured uh, it didn't look good or something and came back down. And uh, we finished the thing uh, probably noon or so on the second attempt or second day, I guess. But the route, the whole thing was uh, difficult climbing. There wasn't anything easy on it from, from bottom to top. How did you find Willens as a climbing puzzle? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting fellow, you know. I uh, spent time uh, chatting with him and stuff, and I was in his apartment with his wife, Audrey, and, and he showed me some photographs. In fact, he showed me pictures on the direct Chima Grand, the Brandler Hassey, before I'd done the thing. I asked him about it, and he had done it. He climbed the thing and uh, showed me some pictures. So I had a little bit of information what it was like before I, when I went to the Dolomites and did the climb. Do you remember climbing the north face of the Tour of Mayan? That's yeah. a good story. Yeah. That's a great story if you could tell it. Well, they did attempted that thing too from what I can gather but there's a, a very smooth uh, limestone band in the bottom it's extremely steep and it's basically crackless and uh, I can't remember the name of the fellow I did it with. Court Richards. Court Richards right. So Court and I went up there. I'd been up there once before I think with Rick Sylvester I think it was him and it was gunfire down in the valley. They use that area there on the side of the slope and, the, and that particular cliff as target practice, the Swiss military. And so suddenly we're, you know, fiddling around on the bottom of this thing and we hear this boom from down below in the valley. So we just tightailed it out of there as fast as we could. Then I went back later with uh, Court Richards and the key to the uh, entire climb was this incipient little fracture in the bottom, little seam which would take uh, rips. And the Europeans didn't have ropes then. That's something we brought over with us. And that's the only way we were able to do that. I think we placed a couple of bolts up high in one of the hanging blaze. But it's a beautiful wall, 700 feet high. I lost my page here. 
okay. Um, what do you remember? Uh, I, I'm kind of going all over the place because John keeps interjecting. So, but that's all right. It's why we edit. Um, what was a typical day in Laison for you? Typical day, summer or winter? Let's start with summer. You know, I made a lot of trips to the Tour d'Ain in that area up there where I went climbing. And uh, whenever I could round up somebody to go climbing with, and then I had my chores and stuff like that, you know, get up in the morning and have a continental breakfast and then work at whatever I was doing and have lunch, that sort of thing there. And uh, in the wintertime, there seemed to be more going on. You know, I had the sister hotel, as I mentioned, down on the... Uh, down below uh, the Club of Vagabond. And we could put our skis on right outside the chalet, you know, the Club Vagabond, and ski down through the village to a gondola, then ride the gondola up to the ski area up above, ski up there all day long. And then at the end of the day, there was a traversing route where you could traverse over and go here and there and then wind up right back in front of the uh, Club Vagabond, never take your skis off. So that was kind of neat. And I went skiing as often as I had tickets. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. did that walk several times from the top of the gondola all the way around to the little uh, restaurant that you could get across the road and Yeah, I had a meal one time there with Harlan. Dougal Hassan was involved, and I'm not sure who else, but it was uh, Raclette. Yeah. yeah. That was a great meal. They take a wheel of cheese and they cut it in half. Then they slide the exposed edge up to a grate of wires, red hot wires. And that outer surface of the cheese starts bubbling and they scrape that down onto the plate. And they serve that with uh, little boiled potatoes and tiny little onions and white wine. So anyway, we're sitting there eating this meal. And the waiter, of course, has to run back and forth because you only get a couple bites. Then now, uh, you know, cheese is gone, so you got to wait. But anyway, bottle after bottle of white wine. And I remember everybody was slurring their words. <laughs> that was one of the better meals that I had over there, actually. It's funny when you have a good meal, the, how you remember them. John and I had an incredible steak tartare in Zurich last year. Well, ne I'll never forget it. It was so good. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Europe has fantastic food. <laughs> yeah, like their cheese. <clears throat> yeah, I bought some raclette cheese one time back in Boulder, Colorado. And obviously you don't have the red hot grate. So we put aluminum foil in the oven. We'd cut slices and put it on there and it's not nearly as good. You lose the flavor of things when you're not in a foreign country and this and that. What were, you, when you got there and there were all these British climbers that you had heard about and read about, and uh, what was your first impressions of these guys? My first impression of the, of the British climbers? A wild group of people. How so? Well, their lifestyle. They had an interesting terminology for people that died in the mountains. They used the term, so-and-so got the chop, which I'd never heard before. I thought it was a little bit uh, too graphic. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I didn't really get a chance to climb with the British there very much. It was one fellow, and I don't remember his name. He, he was a fellow I talked before about. Him and I were on the motorcycle, and this guy came up behind us in a sports car and tried to shove us off the road up there in one of the passes. And he and I did a couple of routes together, and I think that was it. The only British climber I did anything with. They seemed to be, uh, you know, busying themselves uh, 
in the social part of things there at Lausanne, enjoying that. And I don't know if they didn't like the climbing up there, or if they just, it was a different type of holiday for them, apparently. Is there anybody that really you do remember that sticks out from the club Vagabond of Lausanne? Willens and Haston. Tell us a little bit about Dom Willens. Just what, you know, what was his personality like? He had a very explosive personality. Uh, I, uh, one time we were sitting around the table, Harlan was there, Haston, and I had this matchbook in my hand and I was fiddling with the thing. You know, kind of a nervous sort of thing. Half listening and half fiddling, and suddenly Willen slapped the thing out of my head and said, Stop that! <laughs> he was funny, wasn't he? Yeah, he had a good sense of humor, right? He had a very dry sense of humor, but he had people laughing all the time. Yeah, I'd seen photographs of uh, Willens climbing in the Kaisergeberg, different places in Europe and stuff that I remember. So he had an enormous reputation when I, by the time I arrived there. And you just did that one route with him? That was the one time you climbed with him? No, we did two climbs. Uh, Harlan and I and Willens did a route. It was a crack on one of the uh, pillars there on the, on the Tour d'Ai. And I remember Harlan took off and led the first pitch. And he got about 30 feet up in a climbing rope unraveled from his waist and fell all the way down on the ground. So Willens are sitting there laughing. I thought that was kind of funny. I guess he didn't tie the thing properly or something. Then higher up, uh, Willens let a crack up there, which is uh, slightly off with. Went about 40 feet with nothing. Didn't even concern himself with protection. He was a very bold man. I know years ago I read an article in one of the British climbing journals, and uh, it talked about a climb called Fort Lightning Crack. And apparently he climbed the thing without protection and it was desperately hard or something. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, he had a big reputation for that sort of thing. Did he and Harlan get on well together? Probably, yeah, yeah, yeah. I never seen anything to indicate otherwise. I didn't see John a lot. You know, he had his family there and everything in Lausanne, and occasionally he would come into the Club Vagabond, not very often. Oh, really? I think so, yeah. Huh. I know that uh, John Harlan's son has more time for him than Harlan. Really? Yeah, I, don't know. I didn't know that. Well, he doesn't speak very well on it. He just wrote a book with his father last year. Yeah. He doesn't speak well on him. So speaking of Dougal, you said that he was one of the people that you really remember. But what, do you have any, what was he like? I mean, what was his personality like? A very dedicated climber. He had his uh, moods, times very quiet. And we went to Zermatt to climb the north face of the Matterhorn. And uh, I, I enjoyed the time with him there. We wandered around the village and drank beer and stuff and watched the, you know, the drizzle and everything. I think we were there for about a day and a half and then got out of there because it was obviously not going to improve uh, weather-wise. We just wandered around the village and stuff. and. A lot of Japanese climbers in in, uh, in Zermatt at the time, and there were like seven or eight of these guys all clustered together, hiking around the village, all tough-looking dudes. <laughs> and uh, we found out that uh, someone had done the North Face, I think shortly before we got there, and they said they could hear the water running down in the back of the wall. You know, the ice is out here, and they could hear the water running down inside. So it must have been pretty dicey. So are there any other routes that come to mind that you did up above Laison? Chenard and I uh, climbed the prow, the extreme right-hand side of the Tour d'Ai. You know, you drop around the corner, drop down into the valley, and then you got the big wall there in the Tour d'Ai. And uh, we thought that might be a first ascent, but I'm not certain. You know, it's it's a real prominent pillar, and those things tend to go first. You know, rets or pillars, and uh, 
We got caught in a snowstorm, I remember that. Conditions got pretty nasty by the time the thing was done, but we did get all the way to the top. And then I did a bunch of other climbs, you know, during the time period I was there, and they were just face climbs, wall climbs, you know, climb this crack system, go over 200 feet and climb another crack system. So you just climb with anybody you could find at the back? Anybody I could find. How would you go about that? <laughs> well, you know, in a place like that, it's a small community. I mean, you find out in a hurry who the climbers are. And like Mick Burke, I talked to him a number of times, and he didn't seem to be keen on climbing, you know. It was, it was, he had his jobs and stuff there. That was perhaps the reason, but uh, we never got together. And he came to the States... Uh, some years later, and we climbed the north face of Hallett's together in Rocky Mountain National Park. So I finally got a chance to climb with him. In fact, in the uh, in Beyond the Vertical, there's a picture there on a Jackson Johnson in the upper part, and that's uh, Mick Burke. So did you never get a chance to, to climb or to guide to the ISM? Did they never ask you to? The guides? Did they never ask you to work there? No. no. Did you ever no. work at ISM? No, no, I didn't. I, I didn't. I didn't have the impression when I was there the second time that it, the the, the uh, guide service was really all that well developed. You know, I I didn't have the impression there were a lot of people, uh, you know, training people, teaching people, and guiding people. That was uh, not the impression that I had. I could be wrong. I know Rick uh, Sylvester came out of that school, and he was brand new. You know, he graduated or whatever it is they do, and then I grabbed him and I went to the Dolomites. Tell us a little bit about that trip. In your book, he says that uh, he was in Don Willem's room in the Vagabond, and his wife came up and said, Leighton Corps is looking for somebody to climb with. Yeah, sounds right. And he just assumed it was to climb up above town, but you ended up going on this road trip with him and his wife. And he had a car. He had a car. Yeah, he had a car. That's a valuable possession. Because otherwise you got to ride trains around and stuff and then walk forever. So that was a, he was a valuable individual. <laughs> yeah, we just jumped in the car, uh, the four of us, and took off. And we went first, I think it was, to, uh, well, what's the name of that? Maestri's big climb, the Rota de Val. Yeah, the Rota de Val. And, uh, Started up that, but he didn't have experience enough, and uh, he tried really hard. And I, I, I was like 150 feet up in the air in a sling belay, and I, you know, rope was running through uh, so many carabiners. It's all aid climbing, and I wasn't able to really give him a, a good pull to help him in this uh, lie back in the bottom, which is really strenuous for him. So we left there, and then uh, went back into the Brenta Dolomites. It was a six-hour walk to get back in there, spent a night at a hut, and then uh, climbed the uh, Chima de Ambiz the next day, and then immediately hiked out of there and went back. But uh, fantastic climbing. I mean, anywhere, anywhere in the Dolomites, any of those climbs are sought after and they're well worth doing. You mentioned that you left your girlfriend and his wife at the trailhead. Yeah. What yeah. happened to them while they were there waiting for you? Well, they, uh, I think they got bored. They were both very angry when we got back. And I don't remember what the reasoning was and why we left them there. It's just been so long ago. But I know they were really unhappy because we were gone a long enough period of time that they'd had it. So we got back and we got in trouble. Well, didn't they have an encounter with a local man? I'm not going to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> We don't want to get your reputation. No. Yeah, okay. no that's, not, that's not the appropriate sort of thing to talk about. I told him you probably didn't hear, and I'm not going to do it in front of the camera. I, I didn't hear. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't try to trick you on that. Good old Rhoda, eh? Yeah. What was his wife, Rhoda? Well, I'm sorry, what? Rick's wife, her name was Rhoda. Rhoda, that's Rhoda. right, yeah. I remember now. She Rhoda. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's what I heard. 
Well, you know, the reason was she uh, wanted she wanted to be a tourist. She wanted to go to Rome and Paris and those places, and uh, he didn't want to do that. He wanted to stay there and climb. So there was a conflict of interest there, and uh, that's uh, what uh, led to the problems they had later on, apparently. Pike and things like that, and uh, then there were the people that partied all the time. So there were different groups there, and they all had their, you know. Did you take let's, off? Do, let's do that over again, just to try to answer it this time. Um, don't you know? Don't answer it. Just answer it by saying, "I only hung out with the climbers," and then explain the whole caste system. Okay. I pretty much hung out with the climbers, uh, you know, that's uh, the reason I was there, but there were other groups, you know, the skiers had their, their little community and uh, the people that liked to party all the time, they had their little group and stuff, and, uh, which is understandable. You know, people go to Europe for different reasons, obviously. Did you uh, take part in the, uh, the activities in the bar in the evening? Sometimes, yeah, sometimes when I had a little extra change. Usually my practice was to get a bottle of wine and just go down and sit down in the corner and listen to people. Fascinating. <laughs> Were you surprised when you went there, thinking, uh, you alluded to earlier with the wildness of the British guys in terms of the lifestyle. Were you surprised that they could live like that and still climb pretty hard? Did that surprise you? Yeah. I was amazed to a certain extent, but you know, I didn't really climb with all that many of the British climbers there. They just weren't climbing that much. You know, they had a pool table there somewhere. I'm trying to remember where that was at. It was maybe it was at a restaurant or something. And Dougal and uh, Mick Burke and some of the other fellows were over there shooting pool a lot. You know, I wasn't interested in pool, so I just went there to kind of hang around and chat with the guys and stuff like that. But. Uh, they didn't seem all that keen on going up and climbing up there. Maybe they'd already been up there or something. I don't know what their reasoning was. <clears throat> you know, like, I don't know if you know, but there was, like, there was a tradition, not anymore, but when I was climbing in the 50s, 60s, the tradition was that, you know, everything went out the night before and get really hammered. And they usually would get on the hill until after midday. And you didn't really feel like you had done the route right unless you came down in pitch dark. Mm. That, that was a kind of tradition. Late starts, huh? Late starts, right. Yeah. And come down late, and uh, that's you were. That was how you kind of felt yourself as being a hard man by doing that. I mean, it was kind of yeah. stupid in a lot of ways, but it doesn't happen anymore, of course, because they take themselves seriously. I've always liked to get an early start in the morning, and if there's complications, weather problems, or one thing or another, uh, you have plenty of time to get back down again. Well, I think it's interesting, if you read Good uh, Master's book, and he's talking about Robert Smith, and he said he was always amazed at the poverty of the equipment that Robert Smith played with. Terrible stuff. But he then realized that Robert Smith did that because that's how he played the game. He always wanted to be on the edge. Uh, yeah. He wasn't really yeah. interested in being control of the situation. He wanted the situation to be out of control. That was hmm. how he played that game. Well, that's not how we played it in Colorado. We avoided <laughs> lightning storms. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought there was enough risk factor connected with climbing. Period. That you don't have to uh, climb with junk. Yeah. No kidding. Equipment, you know. Speaking of that equipment, so you you guys were largely responsible for bringing over the modern equipment, American equipment. Well, you know, Robbins had been there before, and I don't know what the situation was then in relation to what Chenard had developed, you know, the chromoly pitons and stuff like that in the Werps. But he had done the American direct with Hemming, you know, on, uh, on the Drew. And so he'd been over there. I don't remember how many years it was earlier. Maybe it was just a short trip or something. I said, we don't know. So I'm sure he introduced uh, Chromali at that time, probably. But I know like in the 
Tour Mayenne uh, without ropes and knife blades, we could have never done that climb. It would have been a whole row of bolts up the bottom part of the the uh, wall. So they must have been the, the Swiss climbers and French climbers and so forth must have been fairly impressed by this equipment. I mean, or did they did they evolve into using it, or did they just continue to use bolts and soft iron pins? Well, I would think uh, just from the technical aspects, how much easier it makes. Uh, hard aid climbing that they would have, uh, you know, got their own selection of pitons, I would think. You know, and uh, climbs and stuff I did on the Dolomites, everything's fixed. It's all pins, you know. If it's aid climbing, you can tell because they're three feet apart. And if it's free climbing, they're 15 feet apart or whatever. So it's, uh, it's, it's a given in terms of what's, what you're doing there, whether you're free climbing or aid climbing. And they're all soft pitons, you know, Cassine pitons and... Uh, some of these uh, pitons that came out of Austria, I believe. Did you have any sense of um, a feeling of antipathy towards you from Swiss and German and French climbers? Because, you know, they always felt that they owned the Alps. And, you know, they knew everything there was to know about climbing. And they had this huge tradition. Did you ever get that feeling that they perhaps didn't want you there or thought you were maybe just amateur or whatever. You mean like under the, the freeways, the, the big uh, bridges and stuff, go home Yankee? <laughs> yeah. I don't know, I had, uh, I'm sure I sort of wondered about it, but uh, you know, there's no restrictions. I mean, you can go over there and climb anywhere you want. You can stay in the huts as long as you have a passport to give the people in the huts. So they make sure you're going to pay the bill before you leave. But I never had any, you know, difficulties in any of the people there to speak of. When I was in the uh, Kaisergebirge, there were a lot of British there. In fact, I uh, rounded up a couple guys to climb with. One of the fellows was from uh, Scotland. We did a route there in a trading stool, which means preacher stool. And the four of us went up there, and it's a real short climb. It was one of those old Dudulfer classics. And the thing was over with before it got started, but uh, the rock and the Kaiser. Kaisergeberg is fantastic rock. It's the best limestone I've ever seen. It has a blue lichen on it. And I really enjoyed my time there. And I felt more comfortable because there were British climbers around versus, you know, being all Germans or all Austrians or something like that. Did you meet any of the, the, of the you know, great European climbers of the day when you were there? Did you meet Panati or Maestri or any of those people? No, I met uh, René Desmazon. Chenard introduced me to him because he spoke French. And then Pierre Mazaud. I met him in a restaurant there, and he was really a nice guy. He was really friendly and everything, and, and uh, so I enjoyed uh, chatting with him a little bit. He became a political figure, I believe, later on. But he had uh, done this uh, route on the Chimo Ovest with uh, René Desmazon. So uh, I got to meet the team there, you know, years after they had done the climb. And it was a good route. Uh, they didn't do any necess unnecessary bolting or everything up there. They, those guys are good climbers, there's no doubt about it. What well, did you wear on your feet now? Wear, wearing my feet? Yeah, rock climbing. A pair of uh, boots, Le Folk, means a seal. You know, they had a piece that folded over out of rubber and you know the little uh, grommets sticking up and you could little holes in them so you could and they cover the whole foot you know the front of the foot because they're basically for mountaineering they're excellent little boots so I did the uh, hard rock climbing in those things did you get those in Europe right yeah so what, what did you take from America to the left what did I take yeah, what kind of boots did you have Oh, I don't even remember. All right, I used to climb in, uh, uh, what was the name of those things? They came from uh, Innsbruck, Austria. Kronhofer's. Kronhofer. Yeah, all the, virtually all the hard climbing I did in the States up to when I got uh, the Sportivas was done in Kronhofer's. Pretty good boot, pretty good shoe. They're called a clutter shoe, I remember that. The actual terminology. And they were expensive too. 
Let's just quickly get back on. To, we can take a quick break, talk a little bit about the stuff that we might want to talk about, and then finish up. Um, okay. But just quickly to get back to the Laison. And I know we went through this yesterday, but the sound just wasn't good. Um, do you remember the Rankins, the people that owned the Vagabond? I remember them being a very friendly couple. They were really nice. Yeah. Let's just. I remember it. them more than I remember the uh, Dutch fellow who was a co-owner, co and also the uh, gal from England, I believe. Joan Seaman. Joan Seaman. Yeah, that was her name, and the Dutch guy was Luck van der Kay. Luke van der Kay. Luke Banner, okay, that sounds right, yeah. You know, I thought it was really nice of those folks to give me a job right away, you know. I mean, that really helped me, made an enormous difference in the amount of time I stayed there and, uh, you know, the comfort factor and everything else, you know, having a place to live and stuff and go skiing and, and go climbing and do all of these things, without which uh, I would have uh, been in Europe a lot less period of time. Let's rephrase that just one more time but uh, about the Rankins. Just bring, use their name, like, yes, I remember Alan and Carol Rankin, and then just say what you just said. Yeah, I remember uh, Alan and Carol Rankin, uh, and uh, when I arrived there, they uh, gave me a job immediately. So uh, I was set for a while. I was comfortable. I had a place to uh, sleep and eat and uh, a base from which to go climbing and skiing. So they were an extremely nice couple. I think everything was toned down by the fact that when I was in Lausanne, you know, like I mentioned earlier, American school, American college, people I knew were there. And it was not really like being in Europe, per se, like if I'd have been off in Paris by myself or some of these other places. It was just like a little America, I guess you'd call it that. But anyway, once I got off and started traveling and went to Italy, the Dolomites and stuff, I hitchhiked over there actually one time. And uh, then, then you feel like you're in Europe. You get away from the influence of the one school the and college and friends and stuff. <clears throat> one of the things I noticed when I went there in 1960 was uh, that was only of course, 15 years after the water then. And, uh, driving into these little French very good. And I remember thinking that this was wonderful because uh, we had come through a period of rationing. Yeah, when I arrived there uh, with all the Americans and the British and everything, uh, it softened the impact of uh, feeling like I was really in Europe because it's a, it's a, it's a tiny little community of uh, you know people that speak my language uh, and the food in the club vagabond was a type of uh, food that I'd had in the past. It was not really European cuisine by any means. So during that period of time I was there, I felt that uh, you know it was. Uh, not really Europe in the sense that, uh, as it was when I traveled and went into to other areas and other cities and stuff like that. That's good. Um, what do you remember about Annie? <laughs> she was a real cute girl, and uh, we danced together a few times and kidded one another a lot. That's what I remember about her, but she was real sweet. And there were a bunch of girls that worked there, and. Uh, I don't really remember their names other than Ducky and Annie. <laughs> and uh, as I mentioned, we danced together uh, a bunch of times, and then Dougal Haston came along and kind of whisked her away away from me. And that was the end of that. <laughs> now, he was interested in nurses or something. I think the girlfriend he had before was a nurse or something like that, I remember. He uh, liked nurses. I don't know if it was sort of a medical attention he got or what it was, but uh, the real truth eventually married her. The real truth, of course, is that nurses and uh, ministers' daughters had a reputation. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was that? Nurses and ministers' daughters had a reputation of being free and easy. Ah, uh, yeah. But didn't he end up marrying, or you end up marrying his girlfriend? Yeah, yeah. Her name was uh, Joy Heron, yeah. Yeah, she uh, she's a good climber too. She's a good wife. 
And her dad uh, was kind of a military stock, I believe. And I remember uh, we were in California. I don't think he liked me too much. You know, we had different spiritual interests for one thing. And uh, I don't think he cared for me all that much. And I remember one time we went to a restaurant and I got the hiccups. And he, he wasn't going to put up with that very long. So we're, we get outside the restaurant and we're walking down the street. And he comes up behind me and with the palm of his hand he hits me in the back as hard as he can. And I think part of it was the fact that he went all that nuts about me. And here's a chance I can hit this guy and get away with it. He really smacked me hard and knocked me the breath out of me. But the, the hiccups were gone. <laughs> yeah. Joy, I'm not sure where she was from. I thought Edinburgh. Because her and Dew were real close. And uh, she uh, showed up in Lausanne at one point, and, uh, and I talked to her a little bit there. And, and then suddenly Dougal uh, didn't want her anymore for some reason. And he uh, had found somebody else or something. And then uh, Chenard came along, and Chenard took off with her. They went climbing together and did various things. So it was a, a real small climbing community there. Everybody kind of knew what was going on and all that types of things. So did she follow you to the States? No, she, uh, what happened was she got a job in San Francisco there at the hospital. Worked in ICU, I think. And then I ran into her in Yosemite. And then she moved from there to Boulder, where I was living. And we started spending time together, and later on we were married. Speak uh, to that for a minute. That's kind of interesting, what you said, the small community of climbers in Lausanne. So there must have been people sleeping with people and everybody knowing about this stuff. I mean, there must have been a sort of a, a, a soap opera feel from time mm. to time. I mean, but were there conflicts? Well, you know, I, I'm just the only thing I can remember is were the climbers. There were all these other people, and who knows what they were doing. I know one evening I went down to crawl into my bed there, and there was a couple in there. And uh, you know, there, and I said, "Wait a second, this is my bed. You're going to have to get out of there." And he was upset when he said, "Wait a second, now this this is where I sleep every night." So I got very forceful, and eventually they got up and left. <laughs> The poor woman was incredibly embarrassed, naturally. <laughs> you know, the gall of some people, what can I say? I didn't, uh, you know, really travel a lot. A trip to the Dolomites and, you know, uh, I went down to Paris and went around there a little bit. And the trip to England to pick up some money that uh, the Daily Telegraph had promised all of us. And apart from that, you know, I just pretty much stayed there. So I didn't have the money to really do the things I wanted to do. I mean, you know, a lot of people go to Europe just to eat and drink. I mean, it's a fantastic place for the food and the alcohol and whatever. And uh, I didn't have money to do those sorts of things. You know, I was very limited in what I could do, and what I could spend. I had to really pinch the pennies. Yeah, I've been back uh, once or twice, I think. The last trip was uh, the Northern Limestone Alps, and I climbed the Austrian Alps and the Dolomites, and that was it. You love your limestone, don't you? Love limestone, favorite rock, yeah. You know, granite's much more compact and solid, but uh, limestone has a nice, uh, I think of it as a European flair about it. But I've always uh, liked limestone. In fact, up in Glenwood Springs, I lived there for eight years, and there were little limestone outcroppings, not real big ones. At one point there, they had a dome, which was about 300 feet high, and it was the best rock in the area. And I went up and did a route on that. And uh, the next thing I knew, there was a mining company up there, and they just chiseled the face away. And I'm just a horrible-looking scar when I got all done. And a real sad. But people have to have lime to mix with Portland cement, water and sand if you're going to build a house, whatever. <laughs> anyway, as a climber, it was a real disappointment. When you went to Europe uh, the second time, you did get a chance to go climbing. Did you find that 
climbing was a disappointment in any way? Or were you, you know, I mean, you had climbed in the valley, you had climbed in Colorado. By that time, you had climbed in all of these stuff in the desert as well. Is that right? Yeah. No, I was, I was never disappointed. In fact, uh, you know, where can you go, like, say, the north face of the Chima Grande and climb 1,500 feet in seven or eight hours? I mean, all the things are pinned up. They got wonderful hut systems, unlike the states. I mean, uh, I, I was told the uh, trail systems in the Alps were completely finished by the late 1800s. In other words, they'd map these things out. They know how to take care of their mountains. They had this uh, wonderful hut systems and good food and stuff. And I mean, it's really designed for climbing, much more so than the states. Look at Camp 4 in Yosemite. What a mess. Oh yeah, yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, had I been able to earn a living there, I would not have left, other than maybe go back and visit with the relatives and stuff like that. I would have stayed in Europe. And uh, had I been born there, I would have been comfortable there all of my life climbing. It was a fantastic place. Your family background, where did they come from originally? My father came over from Holland when he was uh, six years old on a steamer and uh, settled uh, I think it settled in the area, it was Iowa, or one of those states there, Nebraska or something. And they had a clan of uh, Dutch people there. And I'd go up periodically, we'd go off and visit relatives and stuff like that, and they'd all come from Holland. And uh, on my mother's side, uh, she was German. And uh, in fact, her father, they had 12 kids in the family, all developed into big families and stuff like that. And he was from Germany. And he probably came over when he was younger, too. I don't remember the years or anything like that. But uh, I know in Iowa and in Minnesota, there's a bunch of different, uh, they have Norwegian clans, too. I like this uh, a fish that's called lutefisk. I don't know if you fellows have ever heard of that before, but I like to have that in the winters. In fact, I've still got some in the refrigerator now. And all they do is put it in a sheet and boil it, and then they uh, you know, get fresh butter and melt the butter and pour it over the top of it. It's got a real interesting flavor to it, unlike anything I've ever had, you know, seafood. I, I think we're done for now. <laughs>